welcome everyone. I'm your host, Eric Novick, and I'm very excited to have Tamara Broderick from MIT joining us today. Welcome to the program, Tamara. Hi, great to be here. Excellent. So now currently you're, you're Associate Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT, that's what one department, right? They have like- Yeah, department. yeah, yeah. It's got a lot in it, but it is a single department. It's actually a humongous department. <laughs> okay, uh, that's what I thought. And you do research in Bayesian inference, but you you started you know, your, your studies as a math major, right? And so how did you end up at MIT uh, doing Bayesian research? Yeah, so, okay, this is a little bit involved. Hopefully that's okay. So I, I, I've always loved math, physics, and computer science. I always thought they were fantastic. Um, and so I went into undergrad, and I actually took the classes for all of those, um, but they would only let me major in one thing at my undergrad, so I, I had to choose something. So I chose math, which was great. But, um, but I, was, I was really enjoying this, um, and there were sort of a lot of threads of interest that I had while I was an undergrad. So on one hand, I was doing a lot of sort of astrophysics and physics research, which I really enjoyed. I um, was taking a lot of math classes, obviously as part of my math major, and in particular, um, Princeton, my undergrad, is really good at analysis as a particular area of math. And back at the time, machine learning was not like a really big thing, but I took this one machine learning class and I really enjoyed it. And so on the face of it, these all seemed really different to me and like they had nothing to do with each other and that I was going to have to eventually figure out what I would do with my life. But looking back now, I realized these were actually all pretty related to where I ended up. So on the um, astrophysics side, and, and more generally physics. Um, so I was doing some work with a physicist who was sort of getting into genetics. We were using tools like Monte Carlo and Markov chain Monte Carlo. And I was like, oh, these are really useful tools. I wish I better understood them because every tool for data analysis has pros and cons. And, and so I, I wanted to know more about that. And I also just really enjoyed, you know, making an impact in an applied area. I thought that was really cool. I was taking all these math classes and analysis and eventually I took measure theory. I really enjoyed it. So I sort of talked to the, um, the head of the, the, or the undergrad uh, sort of liaison in the department, this professor, I said, oh, can I do something with measure theory? And he was kind of like, oh, measure theory is dead, but you should check out probability theory. And I was like, oh, that sounds fun. And I'd, I'd love to do that. And so I, I did, you know, I took this machine learning class and, you know, I, I think just because it was an intro undergrad machine learning class, um, which by the way, so many fewer people in this class now uh, than, than there are now. So like I taught our undergrad machine learning class last semester, I think it was like 500, 600 people, but it was just a, a few of us at the time. And so I took this class, there was AI or machine learning, and I was like, oh, I really want some more math in this, you know, that would be really cool. I didn't know what to do with myself coming out of undergrad. And so I went on one of these um, Bring Americans to England scholarships, which was great, because uh, it gave me a little more, more time to think about what to do with my life. And so I went to, to Cambridge in the UK, and, and that's where I discovered basically statistic and Bayesian inference in particular. And it was just this perfect marriage of everything I was interested in. It was like, oh, these were actually the tools that we had been using when I was doing the astrophysics and physics work. Oh, this uses this beautiful probabilistic mathematical framework. It uses measure theory, especially areas like Bayesian nonparametrics within Bayesian and brands. And then it was bringing in these ideas and connecting to ideas in machine learning that I'd seen. And it was like, oh, this is so perfect. I I really want to keep studying this and, and working on it. And I, I got to work with some amazing people in Cambridge too on some research projects. So Bobby Gramercy and David Mackay, um, and they're both really fantastic. And so I was like, oh, I really want to do this for my PhD. And so I applied to Berkeley, basically work with Mike Jordan on Bayesian stuff. And that was a lot of fun. Um, and so that's sort of what I've been doing since. I, I should say, I don't do strictly Bayesian things. I, I do other forms of sort of like uncertainty quantification and robustness quantification. But I, I definitely feel very close to Bayesian inference. I feel like it's a really nice framework. And obviously my talk today is about our work in Bayesian inference. So. Cool. Thank you for that. So uh, I'm wondering when, when you just started working in Bayes, you know, they, we, we, we didn't have a lot of robust samplers that worked yeah. for a lot of problems. Did you have to write a lot of your own sampling algorithms? And how would you compare to what you're doing today? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's totally different. So either, uh, sometimes I'd be writing my own sampling algorithms. So we did things like important sampling, give sampling, stuff like that. Sometimes there would be code that somebody else had written in a related paper, and we would, you know, use some of that and cite it. But it was, everything was essentially hand coded uh, with all of the pluses and minuses that go with that. I think a really underappreciated aspect of today's amazing automated methods is that you can avoid bugs more. I think like just bugs in code are like, you know, it's prosaic. It's something, it's something that, you know, isn't, isn't sort of like maybe a sexy thing to talk about, but it's something we all deal with. And I think it's really nice that we can get away from that. And so I was first introduced to, um, to having any kind of like automatic sampling actually when I was at Cambridge, but I learned about 
and this is a different use of the term bugs, but like the wind bug system and, you know, uh, the forgive sampling. Um, and, and that was very cool at the time, but also obviously it was, it was a bit constrained to things that you could you know, formulate a, a nice good sampler for. And then, you know, nowadays for the work in my lab, I mean, obviously we still do a lot of, you know, hand-coded things just because we're innovating in this space. But if we possibly can, we're definitely going to use some automated language. And so often that will be something like Stan. Sometimes if we're doing something related to variational inference, it might, you know, end up being Edward or something like Pyro or, you know, something else. Um, but, uh, but I mean, it's just a world of difference. So when we want to just get something quick or like say, oh, we're doing Bayesian inference, but we're adding this thing to it at the end, it's just so much easier to have an automated language to turn to. Interesting. Okay, switching gears a little. When I spoke to a few researchers who are older older than you, and they told me they experienced a lot of opposition when working on Bayesian methods sort of early in their career. Have you experienced that at all or or, or not? You know, okay, so I think one thing that is true is that there was a generation for whom the Bayesian frequentist wars were this big deal. Um, it was this, just this huge divide. And, um, and I, I feel like in some sense, I, I guess I was lucky in some ways to come of age at a time where I I think things were mostly more prosaic. I mean, I'm sure it's who I worked with too. But uh, I, I, I feel like mostly I've seen people say, well, whatever works, works. That's Bayesian, that's great. If it's not Bayesian, that's great. Maybe people just don't feel super strongly. And, and there's some sense in which I'm, I'm pretty open to that idea too. Like I wouldn't say that like I'm religious about any particular method. Um, I feel like there are a lot of really nice things about a Bayesian framework. And so I tend to you know, do things in that area. But like I said before, I'm not strictly going to only ever touch Bayesian things. We certainly do things that are outside of that as well. And so I feel like mostly I, I haven't really experienced that. I mean, I've, I've heard occasional things. I mean, certainly I know some people who are, who are sort of staunchly anti-Bayesian. I also know some people who are staunchly Bayesian. So um, but I just, I don't, I don't think it is like it was back in the day, you know? It's also, I, I mean, I don't know if it's a property. You, you came up through more of a CS route maybe, or yeah, and, I, mean, and so, I think there's, there's less dogmatism in CS. There's a lot more of that in stats departments, would you say? Yeah. You know, I mean, so certainly something that I, I definitely would say is I didn't come up necessarily through a traditional stats background, at least in undergrad. Yeah. I mean, Princeton didn't have a stats department at the time, um, like way back they did, but not when I was there. And so from that perspective, yeah, I was talking to CS people, to physicists, to mathematicians. And I, you know, even, even when I was at Berkeley, like I worked a lot with uh, Jim Pittman. And I think the fact that any of this would be applied to real data was like amazing to him. Whereas like, it, it was always so, so funny talking to Jim Pittman. He's, he's amazing and brilliant. And you talk to him about anything in probability and it's, it's trivial. He's like, I already knew all of this and here's how you prove it. And you know, he knows it. But then you apply something to real data. And I think like, he's like, oh, this is pretty cool. And so that was always a, a nice way to chat with him. But I think that's, that seems to be like a perspective of mathematicians that, you know, they're like a little divorced from this like Bayesian frequentist divide. It's just outside of their realm of, of interest. And so, and so, yeah, yeah. So if you're talking to mathematicians a lot, it seems like it doesn't come up. Okay, cool. Kind of following up on, on this uh, idea that you, you, you work on lots of different me methods, you, you're, your talk will be a, a very specific uh, method of this pairwise interactions, which we're, we're going to hear about soon. But what are some of the other areas of active research that, that you guys are involved in right now? Oh, yeah. So one thing, um, and so this is this is related broadly to notions of uncertainty and robustness, but not specifically Bayesian. So one thing we've been looking at a lot recently is um, various perturbations of, of data. And so one, I think, relatively familiar notion of, um, of changing data that, that everybody who does sort of machine learning or data analysis will be familiar with this is cross-validation. So in cross-validation, you know, you just have, you have your data set and you say, oh, I want to know something about, you know, how well am I doing um, in predictive error or, or in estimation or whatever. And maybe I want to get some sort of notion of uncertainty. And so what I'll do is I'll, I'll sort of perturb my data a little bit. I'll take all of my data points and then I'll drop a few out and then I'll drop a few over here out and then I'll drop a few over here out and so on. And so one issue that can arise with cross-validation is that that can be really expensive. Like there are especially reasons in many cases to to, that you might want to prefer leave one out cross validation because you're sort of getting closer to the full sample size, um, but you don't want to run leave one out cross validation because if you had a linear time algorithm, now you have to run it n times for n data points, and that's going to be like a quadratic time algorithm where you know in general you're sort of picking up another layer of n. And so, are there ways that you can speed that up? And so that's something that we've been looking at in my group is somehow if you are changing your data a little bit, can you use an approximation rather than rerunning an entire input sample? And I think another thing that's been super cool that we've been looking at, like of this flavor recently, 
is understanding what's the worst thing that could happen if you dropped a small amount of your data. And so mm-hmm. an example of this is uh, we studied um, this very influential microcredit studies. You give people a small loan. Does that help them materially in some way? Does it help them bring, out of, you know, bring them out of poverty? And in one case, we found that uh, there's you know 16,500 or more data points, and you can drop one data point and change the sign of the effect. And you can drop 15 data points, like 0.01 percent of your data, 0.1 percent of your data, um, and uh, and and change the sign and significance. Um, and that seems pretty substantial. You know, you can imagine if you were doing a study of microcredit and like Bill Gates happened to walk into your city, that like somehow you think that like just averaging over everybody's profit shouldn't be the right thing to do. Like Bill Gates has so much profit that's going to make it off the charts, you want to like get rid of Bill Gates and then say, okay, what's the profit of the city? And that's sort of what we're trying to do here is to identify like, is there some, some weird outlier here that's, um, that's, that's changing the way that you interpret. Oftentimes in microcredit, you want to say, hey, is this helping a lot of people? Not just, is this doing, you know, on average better? And sometimes it's just our typical tools conflate those two. And so, yeah, so in general, we're doing a lot of this work on sort of, you know, if you change your data just a little bit in cross-validation and the bootstrap and dropping a small amount of data. Can you can you detect what's going on there? Can you do this in a computationally efficient way? Because this would be just combinatorially impossible to talk about dropping all the small amounts of data, but you can do this with an approximation. Very interesting. Okay. So before I have just one last thing, uh, last question that I'll ask you before we, we get started. And, and that is for early researchers, what, what's your advice for sort of getting started in Bayesian inference? What, 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 what should they do? Okay, so I, I, I have an answer to this that I find like seems to strike people as surprisingly controversial, and I think it shouldn't be at all. And I think it's to get started with an application. I think sometimes, uh, especially maybe now because machine learning is so popular, people come in and think like, oh, I'm going to make this this huge advance in machine learning. And I don't want to suggest that you can't. You absolutely can't. Like I think there's there's so much you know realm for people to come in and make these advances. But I think the way to do that is by getting an understanding of what these tools do with an application. I think something that, at least the way that I think of machine learning and statistics and, and Bayesian inference in particular among them, but like more broadly, is that these are service disciplines. You know, what we're doing is providing tools for people to analyze data. And so from that perspective, it, it is a super important aspect of this to make sure that like these tools are working for something. And, you know, obviously there are, there are challenges to this. You want to abstract things a little bit. You want them to be pretty general purpose. But I, I think I think you do want to get a sense of a proof of concept. Like this is working for at least one application. And so working on an application is great. And I think another really great thing about working on a concrete application is that in almost every concrete application, there's something that like isn't quite what people have done before. And so you can often get to the point where it's pretty clear, oh, I need to you know, build this slightly new tool. And then you're starting to innovate. And I think that that can be a really exciting um, and fun process. And, and finally, I'll just say, I think collaborating with people is great. Like it's it's so energizing and so fun. There are so many great people out there um, who have amazing ideas and are really brilliant to work with. And uh, and just, you know, this is, this is like the joy of being in Bayesian inference is that you get to collaborate with people. You have a useful tool for people. Like they are keen to talk to you about it. And I think that's really nice. Thank you. That's great advice. Okay, so let's turn it over to you for the for the main talk. For uh, the rest of our viewers and, and listeners, feel free to put questions uh, for Tamara in the chat. You can use the stage chat, but if you, even if you put it in the event chats, that's fine as well. I'm going to be looking through those questions. If these are of clarifying nature, I may interrupt you, Tamara. Otherwise, uh, we're going to hold until the end of your talk. So let me turn it over to you. Great. Awesome. It's really great to be here today. Thanks for having me out. And today I want to talk about how we often want to find a sparse interpretable subset of covariates associated with some response, but interactions between covariates can make this a much harder problem in a way that I'll make hopefully clear shortly with an example. Um, And so today we're going to talk about a fast and accurate solution. So I really want to highlight some just amazing folks from my group in this. So Raj Agarwal is the fantastic first author, essentially the two papers, mainly one paper, but sort of two papers that I'll be talking about today. The other co-authors are uh, just, again, amazing people in my group. Uh, Jonathan Huggins uh, used to be a graduate student of mine, and now he is an assistant professor at Boston University. Brian Tripp is a current graduate student of mine. And if you have the chance to collaborate with any of them, I, I strongly recommend it. Agree. Again, just as a motivating example, for what we're talking about today. Let's imagine that we've collected data on n different people. So n is the number of people here. And maybe that data takes the form of gene expression levels. And maybe it also takes the form of environmental factors, like how much are these individuals smoking and drinking and eating their vegetables and, and so on. 
And perhaps we're interested in how these various factors are associated with some health outcome like blood pressure. So we want to know which genes and factors are associated with the health issue. And a big challenge that arises here, especially in um, genetic or medical applications, is that often the number of covariates, so here are the gene expression levels and the environmental factors, all these different, all these different factors, let's call that P, that number is much larger than N, the number of data points. And so, you know, despite this cartoon here where that's not too large, imagine that this is just extremely wide and you're not really, not really going to be able to reason too much about that, you know, millions of these at once. Also, it'll be hard to do, you don't want to do scientific studies on a million different things. So you probably want to find a very small subset of these covariates for follow-up science or to reason about them, et cetera. Okay, great. So there's a fantastic statistical tool that will let you do this. This is pretty much, I think, what most people would turn to out of the box, which is the lasso. And what I want to suggest is that the lasso, while being pretty cool, does have some potential downsides for certain applications. So in particular, one assumption that comes with the lasso is what I'm going to call an additivity assumption, but let me just sort of ex you know, express what this means in intuitive sense. Um, suppose that I find that there's some gene that's sort of moderately associated with blood pressure. And suppose that I find that eating lots of sugary foods is moderately associated with blood pressure. And now it may be the case that I find you know, these two moderate associations. And if I had added a model, that's the end of the story. I'm all done. But I think that we all think it reasonably could be the case that if maybe if I have this gene and I eat a lot of sugary foods, that actually this could be super duper associated with blood pressure in a way that is not expressed by the two moderate associations. In some sense, this is the story of things like um, individualized medicine, personalized medicine, that somehow there can be interaction in, in these various covariates. And so we'd like to be able to capture that. And the real challenge that arises is that suddenly this isn't a size P problem, where P was already very big and challenging, but it's a size P squared problem. And that turns out to be super challenging, both from a statistical standpoint, but also from a computational standpoint. That we don't think, think, want things to even scale like P squared computationally. Okay, so this is why this is a challenge. We want to get these pairwise interactions in high dimensions. And so what we're going to talk about today is a fast and accurate method for interaction discovery that happens to be Bayesian. And we're going to see that it provides better scaling in P. We're going to see that it provides better accuracy than lasso-based methods and that it's orders of magnitude faster than naive approaches to Bayesian inference. So one of the things we talked about just a moment ago is how awesome it is that we have these, these you know, really automated methods like STAN and so on. But here we're gonna have to be a little bit more careful if we wanna avoid that P squared scaling. Okay, so the rest of the talk, I'm gonna start by talking about like, let's, let's try to discover these main effects, sort of the associations between each of those covariates and the response, but also these interaction effects of when the covariates interact. And I'll set up a little notation for that. I'll talk about our method. So recall that if I take a Bayesian approach to a data analysis problem, typically there are three steps. I come up with a generative model, a Bayesian generative model that sort of serves my purposes, that does what I want to do. I perform inference and I report my results. And so we're going to see today what is an appropriate Bayesian generative model for this interaction discovery. Um, how do we get inference that's fast, that doesn't you know, take p-squared time, and how do we report results quickly? And then we'll see some experiments on simulated real data and see that this really performs you know, better in practice. So let's start with uh, some setup, some notational setup. Okay, so here we have our cartoon from before, and I'm just going to add a little notation here. So let's call our covariates x1 to xp. Remember that there were p of them, so hopefully that makes sense. And we'll have some response y. Now in general, we're going to collect our covariates. We might collect them in a vector x, and we've added a 1 here so that this will correspond to an offset when we set up our parameters. And now for the nth data point, so we can put that as a, a superscript, we're just going to have a super simple linear model. Like This is, this is you know, the, a really nice basic approach that we can have to discovering what's associated with y. So in particular, if we have this linear model, we're essentially saying, hey, the theta corresponding to the i dimension here is exactly the association between xi and y. This is what we're trying to find. Okay, so this is great. We have our, our linear model. And, and an issue that just immediately arises is this has exactly that additivity assumption that I described earlier. So I have the effect for each, you know, xi from i equals 1 to p, and never the twain shall meet. You know, there's, there's just nothing going on there. But there's an easy way to deal with that. You know, instead of this set of covariates, that's x1 up to xp, how about I also just include the interactions? So now... I have 
a term, a, a, a covariate for x1 times x2, x2 times x3, x1 times x3. Um, every combination of covariates up to x p minus one times x p. So I've just expanded these covariates and we're gonna call that phi two. If I wanna learn interactions, all I have to do is turn my linear model into a linear model with the expanded covariates. You know, that's it. This is, I think, hopefully reasonably conceptually straightforward in terms of building models. I just have this linear model with an expanded covariate set. And now the theta corresponding to x1 times x2 tells me the relationship between that interaction and y. And so in theory, I can get all that I want out of this model. Essentially, what we said is that we want to find this small subset of these covariates that are actually associated with the resp this response, because otherwise this could quickly get out of control. You know, even for a few hundreds of dimensions, now you're going to have, you know, perhaps like 100,000 of these theta. And then we want to estimate them as well. Implicitly in talking like I just did, there are essentially a couple of assumptions. And so let me make them explicit. So one is that there's sparsity. And that takes essentially two forms, sparsity in the main effects. So the theta is corresponding to x1 up to xp and sparsity in the interaction effects. The theta is corresponding to x1 times x2, x2 times x3, and so on. And so first, we're assuming that most of these main effects are negligible. You can think of both of these sparsities as in somehow you know, representing some form of interpretability that we, we don't want to reason about millions of things at the same time. A typical assumption, and one that I'm going to make for the moment here, is also a specific form of sparsity in the interaction effects. Namely, that I can have an interaction only if the main effects are present. So if I find that there's some moderate association between a gene and blood pressure and some moderate association between a lifestyle choice and blood pressure, then I can also have the interaction between them. This is a Reasonable assumption for many applications, but it's not always a reasonable assumption. And so I'll mention that we actually have some work that is hopefully going to be up in the archive very soon, like the next few weeks that gets around this. But the work I'll talk about today does make this strong part of the assumption. I'll mention both of those specifically in the papers involved at the end of this. So what's the problem here? This is, I again, hopefully a reasonably conceptually simple model. It's, it's a linear model. The problem, again, is this p squared. So theta, you know, it's, it's not exactly p squared, but it has order p squared number of elements in it. And so if I have a large P, I don't just have a high dimensional problem, I now have a super duper high dimensional problem. And this is going to be both statistically and computationally challenging. Statistically challenging because we have to sort of find an appropriate setting of theta in this very high dimensional space and computationally because we really don't want to have to deal with P squared in terms of computation. That can be really prohibitive. And so the solution that we're going to use essentially is to make the following observation that if these were any p squared covariates, like if the covariates were like x1, x2 up to xp squared, there's just nothing you can do about that. You know, you, you're going to have a p squared dependency. But these aren't just any p squared covariates. These are extremely structured form of p squared covariates. Really, there's only an x1 to xp there and then this specific quadratic form. And so that's what we're going to use. We're going to use that structure in the covariates together with our sparsity assumption to reduce to a problem that is actually linear in p. And that's what we'll be talking about basically for the rest of the talk. So we set up a little notation, we set up what we're trying to do. And so let's talk through our method now. We're taking a Bayesian approach. Call that some of the nice things about a Bayesian approach are that we can incorporate expert information, you can get uncertainty quantification, and two things that are, are particularly nice here are one, we can get regularization. So we have this high dimensional problem that's gonna be pretty important. And we have the flexibility to encode the assumptions that we want. This is really gonna be important here that we can build up that sparsity in a really easy and nice way. Okay, so again, the three steps of a Bayesian analysis are essentially, I choose a generative model that encodes my assumptions. I compute a posterior, and then just almost in any real life scenario, you're not gonna be reporting that whole posterior, you're gonna report some kind of summaries from that posterior. And so let's talk through what's, what's that gonna look like here. Um, and I'll note going forward that in some sense, while, while we make some innovation in one in this particular paper, our real contribution is in two and three. Okay, so in particular in one, choosing a generative model, we do come up with a new Bayesian generative model. We call it the sparse kernel interaction model. And the main thing here is that it encodes these sparsity assumptions in both the main and interaction effects. Now, I want to be super careful here, though. We are so lucky to build on fantastic work of other researchers. So Carbio et al. 2009 introduced this really beautiful way and, and effective way of including sparsity, the, the Hershey prior. Um, Purinan and Batari in 2017 uh, made this sort of uh, more practical in terms of the regularized Hershey prior. And both Chipman and Griffin and Brown have worked specifically on interactions in Bayesian inference. And sort of the challenge at this point 
was just that these methods could only run on, say, like a dozen, a dimension of a dozen. So a P equals a dozen. And so that's really what we want to get beyond. We want to get something where we can really run this on, on large data sets and in particular large dimensions. Okay, and so that's where we're gonna come in. We're gonna come in and say, how can we compute the posterior? And so we developed this new kernel interaction sampler. And the real challenge here is if you think about it, the parameter vector that we have, this theta that we're trying to learn has size p squared. And so the challenge is how could we possibly do inference on a parameter vector of size p squared in time p per iteration of something like Markov chain of Carlo. Um, and essentially what we're gonna end up doing is finding a representation that encodes all of the information in that parameter vector in an encoding of size p. Now in the face of it, that shouldn't actually solve everything because now you have to report the summaries of the posterior. So if I have to tell you for theta one, for theta two, for theta three, et cetera, what is you know, the posterior on that theta, it sounds like there's p squared of that. So how could I possibly get away from a p squared cost, even if it's just reported? And we're gonna see that here, again, we can use a kernel trick, that's gonna be a, a recurring theme, to report all the non-negligible main interaction effects in OP time. And so here's a really key point, is first that we're gonna be able to get all of this information out of our compressed sort of representation from R2, but two, because of sparsity, there are gonna be so few main interaction effects to report that it won't take P squared time, it'll just. Okay, so let's go in and dig into the details of this kernel interaction trick. How can we get away from this P size cost? Or P squared size cost, two of P size cost. Okay, one thing I'll mention before we go on to this is technically speaking, this kernel interaction sampler and kernel interaction trick aren't just for skin, they actually work much more broadly for a broad set of models. Um, we just use skim in all of our experiments and we think it is a, a useful model to be using. First, let's talk about, you know, again, sort of at the very beginning of this before, before I launched into the talk, we were sort of talking about, you know, hey, we have these super awesome, and again, I really think this is true, really awesome automated methods for doing Bayesian inference analysis, you know, way easier to do it than it was back in the day. And so let's just talk about why you might not want to do that in this case, or at least you, you, might, you might suffer a little bit if you take this naive approach. And so our first MCMC option one is that, hey, somebody gave you this model, it's, it's this nice model that includes sparsity and everything, and it has the, the nice linear form that we talked about before. And they said, hey, I want a posterior over theta. A really natural thing is you just plug this into STAM, right? And see what, what you get out. Okay, well, here are some challenges that immediately arise. One, remember, Theta has size p squared. So it's like p squared parameters that you have to sample. And so the cost of just one iteration is going to have size, well, you know, every single point in the likelihood is going to take p squared time to compute. You have n points, data points in your likelihood, so it'll be p squared n. And so I haven't told you what our method is, but let's start comparing it because why not? And so what you're seeing here is on the horizontal axis, we're making a bunch of simulated problems. So we're making these simulated problems where we're trying to figure out what are, what are this sparse set of covariates and interactions that are associated with a response. We're increasing the dimension of that on the horizontal axis. And it's you'll notice it's a logarithmically increasing dimension. Now on the vertical axis, we're seeing the runtime, again, logarithmically increasing of the different methods. And so our method is in green, and we're seeing that option number one, which I just presented to you here, you know, let's just run this in stand, is in red and it's orders of magnitude slower. Now, I think a reasonable thing you might be asking yourself is, wait, 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 how are you even measuring time here? Because if you're familiar with these things, the real question is, okay, what we actually did was we ran it for a fixed number of iterations, Markov chain and Carl iterations. And so actually did, did the samplers mix? Well, our hat is a nice little diagnostic that at least gives you a sense, even if it's a bit heuristic about whether things were mixing. And we find that with option number one, all of the R hat are such that they indicate that mixing was not going on successfully. Because again, it's trying to navigate this super high dimensional P squared space. And our method, actually, all the R hats indicate that it was mixing. And so if anything, the, the situation is more dire than the plot shows that, that actually probably the running time for option number one is worse if you really want things to mix. Okay, so if you're familiar with linear models, and if you happen to know that the way that we encode sparsity and strong hierarchy actually involves basically conjugate priors, then you might be thinking, why would I sample theta at all? How about instead I just use conjugacy? So let's look at that next. So here's another two. So we've discarded option number one because it didn't seem to be working. Let's look at option number two. Let's use conditional conjugacy for theta. Yeah, sure, there's some other stuff going on that's not quite conjugate, but the, 
the immediate prior and absolute likelihood is conjugate. We just have a conjugate linear model and we can absolutely use conditional conjugacy. And something I'd like to note right here is that I think sometimes when, when we have a basic understanding of conjugacy, we always think, yes, conjugacy is always better. We always want to take advantage of it. And hopefully this slide will help push back against that misconception. Sometimes it's better. Okay, so if you're familiar with linear models at all, you know that you often have to compute and invert something like X transpose X. If you're familiar with conjugate Bayesian linear models, you know that typically you have to compute and invert something like X transpose X plus a prior precision matrix. So the purposes of computation, we don't really have to get into the details of that prior precision matrix, it's got the same size. And so let's focus on this X transpose X cost for computation and inversion. Okay, well remember here, our covariates aren't actually X. They're the expanded set of covariates, this phi 2x. And so really what we need to do is we need to compute and invert phi 2 transpose phi 2. Okay, so x had size n by p. So phi 2 has size n by p squared. And so what is this, what is this going to cost to create? Okay, so one of these has size n by p squared. We're going to pure multiply it by the transpose. And so we have a p squared by n matrix out front. Well, from our basic matrix knowledge, we know that this is going to create a p squared by p squared matrix. And that one of the elements of this matrix computing it is going to be basically doing like an n sized inner product. And so it's going to take time n. OK, so what does it cost to construct this matrix? It costs p squared times p squared times n. So the rows by the columns by how much it costs to put in a particular element. And then to invert this matrix, well, inversion is somewhere between quadratic and cubic in cost. Let's just say p to the sixth. The point is, this is all way, way, way more expensive than even p squared. And we were trying to get things from p squared down to p. And somehow we've, we've made it much worse here. Now, you could be super careful and use these like fancy matrix identities that are out there, like the Woodbury matrix identity, and you can get it down to p squared, but it's, it's still p squared. And this is what we were trying to avoid. And we see this borne out in practice. So here we're doing the same thing as before. We're looking at a bunch of simulated problems of increasing dimension on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, we're looking at a bunch of runtimes for the different methods. If you use this naive method, just using conditional conjugacy and then you know, sampling the other things that are around, um, you get this really expensive cost in red. Um, if you use the Woodbury matrix identity, you can save yourself a little time, but it's still orders of magnitude more expensive than our method. And this is true for memory as well. So this isn't just a running time issue, it's actually a memory issue that it's really prohibitive to do this if you're taking this naive approach or this good variable. So there are a lot of things that are really natural to do that you might do here that are just prohibitively expensive and when you get up to moderate dimension are gonna pretty much get destroyed. And so what else can we do? Well, basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a page out of the Gaussian process playbook and notice that there are certainly some things that we could do faster. So the issue, the whole issue seems to be this computation and inversion of phi 2 transpose phi 2. The way that Gaussian processes get away from this, if you're familiar with Gaussian processes, or if you're not, I'll just tell you, is they don't look at conditional conjugacy for the parameter theta. They look at conditional conjugacy for the whole linear term, theta transpose phi 2. Now we're going to see in just a moment that the plus side of this is that the computation ends up being fantastic. You can take advantage of a kernel trick and you don't have to have this p squared computation. The minus side on the face of it is that, well, the thing we actually want in the end is, is theta. We want the theta values so we can say, oh, these are the um, main effects and interaction effects that are non-negligible and here are the ones that are negligible and you know, actually look at that posterior. And so we're going to have to put that off for a second. You know, to say, hey, what can we actually learn about these theta values? But let's first check that we can even do anything if we were to look at this posterior of theta transpose phi 2. OK, so this is the approach we're going to take. And basically, the observation here is, you know, we just looked at the posterior for the theta transpose, or theta on its own. Basically, the, um, the uncertainty, the covariance, is going to look like phi 2 transpose phi 2. And so now if we're looking at theta transpose phi 2, we're going to sort of pre and post multiply by phi 2. On the face of it, it looks like we haven't solved anything because we still have this phi 2 transpose phi 2 in the middle. But what's actually really cool here is that you just compute phi 2 phi 2 transpose. That turns out to be way faster. And then you can multiply these matrices together and you never have to actually do the matrix multiplication that's so expensive. OK, let's see why this is. So here we have phi 2 phi 2 transpose. 
So this is a similar setup to before, except now we're multiplying our n by p squared matrix by a p squared by n matrix. So the matrix we get out in the end is n by n. The cost of computing one element of this matrix looks on the face of it like we're going to have to do a p squared inner product with p squared. So you would think that this would cost p squared. But this is where the kernel trick comes in. Because it's not just any p squared by any p squared. It's these extremely structured covariates. This is essentially like dealing with a polynomial kernel. In fact, it is basically like a, a small finite sum of polynomial kernels. And so instead of this being a p squared cost, you can actually do this in time p. Again, specifically because of the kernel trick. OK, so then what's the whole cost of computation and inversion in this direction? Well, in this direction, just creating that matrix is n by n by p. So it's just pn squared. And then inverting the matrix is nq. This is the classic trade-off in a kernel trick. So you're saying, hey, instead of a very large or sometimes infinite dimension, I'm going to pay a cost in inverting a number of data points by number of data points matrix. Um, this is why Gaussian processes are expensive. It's exactly this, this cost, well, expensive in the number of data points. And so here we're making the same trade-off. This is you know, not great in terms of the, the scaling of the number of data points, but if you have a very high dimensional problem, again, as is often the case in biology and medical care and you know, other cases, um, then this is very favorable. Now we only have the P dependence. And I'll come back to the N cubed dependence very briefly at the end. Okay, oh, and you know, we already saw these comparisons with these other Bayesian approaches that don't have this, and we see that you know this this has a much more favorable p dependence. On the face of it, we have this like nice way to report our posterior over theta transpose phi two, but again, that's not what we wanted. We wanted the posterior over theta, and so yeah, we can we can represent sort of our posterior in this way that just takes time p for iteration. But can we get out what we want from that? And that's what we're going to answer next. So remember, our goal is to find the main interaction effect. That's that's basically looking at the theta. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to break it into two steps. One, we're going to show that we can report the posterior of any individual effect, either the main effects, the theta is corresponding to the xi, or the interaction effects, the theta is corresponding to the xi, xj, in constant time. And then we'll talk about how that's still not enough, but we can get there. OK, so first, to report this in constant time, let's take advantage of just a, a standard basis vector. So we have a 1 in the ith position. So this has total size p, this basis vector because we're just putting it in x. We're using it as an x value. And let's put it into g. And so if you think about it for a second, with the standard basis vector, all of the elements of phi 2 are going to be 0, except for the element corresponding to xi, which will be 1, and the element corresponding to theta xi squared, or xi squared, which will be 1, because it's 1 squared. Similarly, if we put a negative of that basis vector, we'll get a negative 1 in the ith position, the xi position, and we'll get a negative 1 squared, or a 1, in the xi squared position. And so when we combine these, we can add these up, we can get back out theta xi. And so we can do the same thing, the same trick for theta xi xj. Um, basically, the point is, once I have this posterior in theta transpose phi 2 form, I can get back out the posterior values for the thetas. Now, on the face of it, that's I'm still not done, because if, even if I reported all p squared of these values in constant time, I still have p squared values to report. But remember, we have the sparsity assumption. So by sparsity, a very small collection of the main effects are non-zero. So I report all the main effects. That's going to take p, p time. But very small collection of them are non-zero. And I only have to report the corresponding interaction effects, the k squared interaction effects. And that's just going to take OK squared time. Now, an interesting thing here and an important thing is that we're not doing like some two-stage procedure. We're not learning the main effects and then the interaction effects, we're learning them all together. We're doing them all in our Bayesian model. It's just about being careful how we report them. So let's talk about some experimental results. Now, first question, something that you know comes up whenever I, I talk to anybody who uses the lasso. Are you sure, you know, I might use something Bayesian, uh, but the lasso is super fast. And so we want to check, you know, is this something that you know can also be used by people in a very reasonable amount of time? And the answer is yes. So in fact, the lasso um, is actually a p squared. In, in any of the cases we might apply it here. So in particular, if we apply the lasso to just this extended covariate space problem, you know, just that linear model that we saw before, but with the extended covariate space, 
We'll call that the pairs lasso, and that's gonna pretty evidently take time p squared per iteration. There's also something called the hierarchical lasso by Lim and Hasty from 2015, and that's specifically designed for interactions, and it happens that that takes p squared per iteration as well. Now remember, we just showed that our method only takes time p per iteration, so eventually we expect it to overtake the lasso, but we should double check that actually the constants aren't misleading here, and that it'll actually be pretty good up to that point. And so that's what we're looking at here. So again, on the horizontal axis, we're increasing the dimension of our problem um, in a logarithmic way. And it's, it's a bunch of simulated data sets that we're running on. On the vertical axis, we're looking at runtime increasing logarithmically. And we see that our method, which is in green, is eventually overtaking the lasso within moderate dimension. So the constants aren't too far off. This is something that we can run reasonably for moderate dimension. So the timing looks good. This is something that you could reasonably run both of these four. And now we want to check what about the accuracy in these different cases. Um, and in some sense, you know, th this is, I think, an important part of our, our work here is that like these Bayesian methods uh, work really fantastically. It's just that you couldn't run them in ways to be competitive before. And so now we can really check, you know, how do they work in terms of accuracy? Now there's a real challenge here, which is the following. Um, how do you know that your method is working? So this is a big challenge in terms of parameter estimation in general. Um, you sort of have this issue of, well, you don't have ground truth. So you can't really you know, check, like, am I getting the right values of my parameter? And so we're going to try three different things. First, we're going to look at simulated data, where in fact we do have ground truth. And so we can compare to ground truth. Then we're going to slowly work our way up to real data. We're going to have to be really clever about it, because we don't have the ground truth associations between covariates and responses to check directly. OK, so first in simulated data, again, we, we know the thetas because we made them up. So we can make 30. And also, a nice thing about simulated data is you can make as much data as you want. And so that's really great. We can just make all the data sets we want. We'll make 36 different simulated data sets that have various um, different settings. We're going to look up to p equals 500. On the face of it, this seems like a moderate dimension. It's worth noting, though, if we treat this truly as like this is how many parameters we have, well, we have 125,000 total parameters because, again, this, of this quadratic group. Actually, this is a really challenging high-dimensional problem if we don't take advantage of this underlying structure. We look at both estimation and selection in the paper, and I can direct you to the um, paper, but I'll, I'm just going to talk about selection here. Do we, do we pick out this small, sparse subset of associated covariates well? And one of the things we're going to look at is false discovery rate. What's the proportion of incorrect covariates we're picking out? Now, I'm going to show you a somewhat complex plot, but we're going to talk through everything that's going on here. So on the horizontal axis, we have number of correct effects. So there were five simulated correct main effects. And so the most correct effects that any algorithm can get is five. On the vertical axis, we have number of incorrect effects. So every algorithm can tell me that, yeah, this gene is totally associated with high blood pressure, and it can be totally wrong. And we want to check how many times it's wrong, and that's the vertical axis. Now, if you look up at this, this plus that's in this upper right-hand corner here, that is one run of the hierarchical lasso you know, for one of these 36 different simulated data sets. And so it's saying that it picked up all five correct effects, so that's good. But it picked up over 60 incorrect effects. So that's an order of magnitude more incorrect effects than correct effects. And in fact, this is the sort of behavior we see for the hierarchical lasso in general, which are these pluses, that yeah, it's picking up a lot of correct effects, but it's also picking up a ton of incorrect effects, way more, in fact, than correct effects. And so this would be wasted time after an experiment, you know, where you have to run, or, or wasted time where you have to run a lot of extra experiments that you just don't, you know, really have to. Now, the pairs lasso is these blue Xs, and we're seeing with pairs lasso that it's picking up very few correct effects. Certainly very few incorrect effects too, but, but very few correct effects. And of course we want to pick up the correct effects. Okay, finally, our method are these green dots. And here we're picking up lots of correct effects, all five correct effects in general. In a few cases we're not, but we're getting a lot of these correct effects and very few incorrect. So in general, we're picking up lots of correct effects and very few incorrect effects and the proportion incorrect um, is quite low. And we see this for the pairwise effects as well. So in this case, the hierarchical lasso and the pairs lasso is tending to pick up lots and lots of incorrect effects, although they're also picking up correct effects. In our method, we're seeing is picking up lots of correct effects um, and, and very few incorrect effects. OK, now a reasonable concern that you could have about simulated data is to say, well, the covariants are, 
aren't really realistic. So if you actually look at real data, the variants tend to be super associated with each other. You see a lot of correlation. Um, and so is there a way that we can make this more realistic, more like real data? So we'll do that next. So in particular, we'll simulate data with real covariates. So what we're going to do is we're going to simulate five main and 10 interaction effects again, so we know the ground truth. We're going to look at covariates, real life covariates from this residential building data set. And like any real life covariates, they're highly correlated. Just 20 of them capture 99% of the variance. So now we're going to check how did the different methods do. And in general, again, we want to find as many correct effects as possible. And we want to find as few incorrect effects as possible. OK, so let's start by looking at the pairs lasso. It finds two correct main effects. And it finds five incorrect main effects, so more correct effects. Sorry, more incorrect effects than correct effects. It finds three correct pairwise effects and 21 incorrect pairwise effects. Now, the hierarchical lasso, we see sort of a similar situation. It's finding three correct main effects, three correct pairwise effects. It's roughly the same as the pairs lasso, a little bit better. But it's finding tons of incorrect effects, both main effects and pairwise effects. In fact, orders of an order of magnitude more than correct effects. And again, you know, you think, what's going to happen here? You find these associations, and you, as a scientist, are like, okay, now I'm going to do some experiments. You know, now I'm going to do some follow-up studies. And so this is a lot of wasted time potentially in looking at things that we, you know, didn't need to have looked at. Okay, so in our method, we find just as many correct effects as the pairs lasso and hierarchical lasso. So three main effects and three Errors effects, but absolutely zero incorrect effects. So we're not picking up all this noise. We're not thinking that there are effects that aren't there. What about real data? So again, it might be that, well, the relationship between a response and a set of covariates isn't always going to be perfectly linear. And we want to know if we can really pick up things in real data. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to, by design, choose a very low dimensional data set this auto miles per gallon data set. So it's only six real value covariates that we're going to look at. But what we're going to do is augment this with 200 totally fake, totally noise covariates. So we don't know which of these original six covariates are really associated with miles per gallon. Um, of, this is sort of a car data set. We don't know which ones are truly associated. But we do know that there's no way that these totally fake noise covariates are associated with the response. And so if, if any method picks up on those, then it's clearly you know, picking up on something that's wrong. And again, once we've added these 200 fake noise covariates, this becomes, a, on the face of it, a very challenging high-dimensional problem with 21,000 total parameters. OK, so again, something that's different from the previous slides is now there's no ordering to getting, there's no notion of correct effects, because we don't know what truly is associated with any original data set. We'd like to get something. It wouldn't be a very useful method if we didn't pick up on any associations, but, uh, but we don't know how many there are. On the other hand, with fake effects, we absolutely know that they're all fake. And so if anything picks up the fake effects, that's bad. OK, so let's look at pairs lasso. That picks up four main effects. Again, no ordering on the blue, but zero fake main effects. So that's really good. It picks up two original pairwise effects, no ordering on the blue, but 78 totally fake effects. So that's bad. That's just a huge number of totally fake effects, um, some orders of magnitude more than the total number of original data effects. Hierarchical lasso. Oh, right. Quick, quick, oh, please. quick uh, clarification. Yeah. question from uh, Zo Fang. Are the fake noise covariates in this in this example uncorrelated uh, normal or something like that? Yeah, this is a great question. So yeah, so these are just totally simulated fake noise covariates. We totally need to just run this with correlated set of noise covariates too. I expected that you would see the same thing. Um, but in this case, they are just simulated and uncorrelated. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, and if anything, this is a, it's actually a really interesting observation that even for a simulated uncorrelated you know, noise covariate, you're still seeing this, this very unfortunate behavior here, that these are just tons of these fake effects that are being picked up by these methods. Cool. OK, so here we're seeing that in hierarchical lasso, that this method is also picking up some non-zero collection of original effects. And that's the only way that we can compare the blue. But otherwise, there's, there's no real order. But tons of fake effects. So 46 fake main effects and 38 fake pairwise effects. Um, and so that seems really undesirable. Our method picks up, again, some number of main effects and pairwise effects from the original data set. It's nice to see that it's non-zero, but otherwise it's, it's, there's no real comparison in the blue, but absolutely zero fake effects, which seems really desirable. And it kind of makes me trust the original data effects a little bit more, too, because it's not picking up all of these fake effects. 
Great, so we've seen that this method is competitive with Lasso in terms of running time, and in fact, eventually should beat it because of the, the P squared versus P dependency, and it gets this much more accurate results in terms of what effects are associated with some response. Okay, so let me just conclude. So we have this fast and accurate detection of pairwise interactions. Our original paper on this appeared in ICML 2019. I encourage you to check out the archive version because we did correct a couple of things in that. And so that's the most up to date. Also, while we have some original code associated with that, some amazing Pyro contributors, not us, have actually added this to Pyro, which is, I think, really cool. Because again, it's just really nice to have these things automated and to have code already there for you. Um, and I think people have done an amazing job with Pyro. So I encourage you to check that out. Today, I've really focused on this notion of a pairwise interaction, but it turns out that everything I talked about today um, easily extends to higher order interactions. And we actually include that in the paper as well, although we don't go as deeply into experiments on that. Um, but the, the fundamental mathematical framework extends naturally. Okay, there are a lot of, I think, really natural questions about what to do next, some of which we're working on. So what is, what about non-linearity? So yeah, you know, this is nice if, you know, Y is this linear function of X, but plenty of things are sinusoidal or quadratic or, you know, something else. And also this strong hierarchy assumption is not always appropriate for every application. Sometimes it may be that two things, you know, maybe when you have this gene and you have this lifestyle choice, that that's really associated with blood pressure, but individually, maybe they just aren't. And so we'd like to be able to pick that up. And so these are two things that we're addressing in a new paper that is in preparation and should be on the archive in the next few weeks at the very latest. It's, it's pretty mature at this point. We just need to um, post it, although it is possible that the title may change a little bit before that. But this is basically um, a, a paper that we're putting up very soon. I think it, and the elephant in the room is improving the scaling in N. So yes, we can get away from this P squared scaling, uh, but an N cube scaling isn't great either, or more specifically, whatever the cost of matrix inversion is, which is somewhere between quadratic and cubic. But it's still, it's still too much. I mean, this is why everybody focuses on Gaussian process scaling. I'll note that we have to be a little bit careful in applying things like Gaussian process scaling to this problem. Though. I'll just briefly mention, we do have some work in this area. And so there's a lot of things that people do with Gaussian process scaling, um, but it typically doesn't focus on finite data mean and variance guarantees for Bayesian inference. So really guaranteeing that you're going to be close to a Bayesian posterior mean or posterior covariance. And so that's what we address in our AI Stats 2019 paper. Turns out there are random feature type methods that we can use to also do large scale kernel approximation that we address in another AI Stats 2019 paper. But here's the thing. Typically, when people are talking about scaling Gaussian process, it, it just the vast amount of this literature is thinking specifically about spatiotemporal kernels. Um, and so in spatiotemporal kernels, the idea is that you can take advantage of this very specific structure in Gaussian process scaling. If I'm looking at like pollution readings across the city and two of the sensors are very near each other, I expect them to have the same pollution reading. If I'm looking at pollution readings across time and I look at the time today and the time today plus one minute, I expect them to be very similar. And as I get farther away in time and farther away in space, I don't expect them to be as similar. And so you see this in things like a squared exponential covariance and the Tern and so on. Um, but that's not the type of kernel that we have here. We have almost exactly the opposite kernel. We have this polynomial kernel. And so it's not obvious that you can just apply a lot of the scaling methods that people have for Gaussian processes, at least immediately, to that type of kernel. And so there's a, at least a little bit of a, a you know, a sense of, uh, of question there. Um, and then finally, we're talking about applications now with, uh, with people who are, who are really in the weeds. We're excited to hopefully um, you know, engage more. We're, we're working with a couple of biologists looking at things like um, epistasis and basically interactions in, in genetics. Um, but if this is something that's of interest to anybody, we would love to chat. Absolutely. Uh, we, we'd love to see this in more applications as well. Great. And thank you very much. Great. Thanks. Uh... Great talk. So I, I have, we have a few minutes uh, for questions. So I have a few general questions and then there's some specific questions that people had as well. So the, the first one is, uh, I'm, I'm sort of curious, how did you come up with this idea uh, originally and how, how certain were you that it was going to work? Right, because part of the right part of the research is sort of knowing what to work on, what not to work on, and uh, any any insights on that? Yeah, well, I think we really got into this. I mean, so Raj again is the the first author, fantastic student of mine on on this, um, and he'd been doing all this great work in kernels specifically and sort of scaling kernels. And so you'll see that he had this AI Stats 2019 paper, and I think it just really naturally led into this. That you know, you know, even even if you look at the Gaussian process book. You know, there's this really nice Rasmussen and Williams book from 2006 that talks about like the weight space view versus the function space view. 
And that's like exactly what we're taking advantage of here, just with a polynomial kernel and sort of a different take on it, the sort of maybe more traditional squared exponential kernel or like some kind of spatial temporal kernel. And so I think, I think something that really led us here was that like, again, Raj was really deep in this kernel stuff. It seemed like a natural application of it. And I, I really want to highlight too, how much he's been digging more deeply into since this original paper, functional ANOVA, so that we can use that now to get these like nonlinear interactions and get away from the strong hierarchy assumption. And I just think that's been super cool. In terms of would this work, I guess my personal feeling about like absolutely everything in research is that I kind of like doubt anything's going to work until it does. And so going in, I just, I feel like everything's a flip of the coin. You know, you hope it does there, but there are plenty of things that we've done that like absolutely did not work out <laughs> and, you know, are now on the, the graveyard of our dreams. But, uh, but this one, like certainly, you know, I think, um, I think Raj was doing some, some early work in like simulation studies and that was very promising. And so it seemed like it was going in a promising direction. And there's some sense and even, you know, even after this paper, after we completed this paper, it's like, okay, well, can we really get beyond nonlinearity? Can we really get beyond the strong hierarchy assumption? I actually originally thought that the strong hierarchy assumption would be harder to get beyond, that there was something sort of fundamental about it, that, you know, how could you possibly get away from a P squared cost? without having a strong hierarchy assumption, purely because of reporting reasons. Like at the end of the day, you have this P squared set of parameters that you need to report. And so it seems like strong hierarchy is pretty integral to being able to report that. And I think one of the really cool things that Raj has done in his more recent work is noticing that actually you can have a representation that basically corresponds to whether any parameter occurs in any form. So either a made effect an interaction or higher order interaction. And so once you have that representation, there's some sense in which that representation plays the role of strong hierarchy in reporting. But you only have to look at the things that are non-negligible in that representation. And as long as that has sparsity, that's going to really limit how much you have to do. And so I think that's uh, something that, you know, I don't know, every now and then in our, 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 our research, basically we like, we get lucky, something works out. And, you know, obviously there's an element of like, we hope that these things will work out. There's a, there's a lot of work on kernel methods. And so that was really um, suggestive, but you don't know for sure. Okay. So the, the next thing I wanted to ask, I think you, you partially answered this uh, in terms of if people wanted to try this, would you recommend uh, this implementation in, in Pyro that, that you put up? Yeah, so, so, so I totally recommend the implementation Pyro. Also, we'd love to know how it goes if you're trying it. And then the other thing I'll just, I'll, I'll plug again is that we should have some new code and new implementation going up for this nonlinear interaction mm. discovery going up with the new paper. And so if you're, if you're patient enough, hopefully there'll be, there'll be more to try out then. But yeah, absolutely. I think, I think trying out this, this Pyro code would be fantastic. It's really nice. Cool. And is this your sort of longer term plan is to keep adding it? Uh, in Pyro, or would you, you know, try to put put it up I, somewhere else, or or I, it's still undecided? Is fine, fine too. I guess I I, sh I should emphasize that we didn't add it to Pyro, so it's really up oh, okay. to. Okay, yeah, yeah. This was this was someone else. Yeah, sorry. Pyro, yeah. I I I would love for people to keep adding our methods to amazing <laughs> languages. I think that that sounds fantastic. My long term plan is to encourage people to do that, <laughs> and and to the extent I can get my students to do it too, that's great. But uh, but I think that, I think it's really wonderful uh, that this happened. Cool. Okay. So then uh, I have a few more specific questions from, from the audience. So first one from Fred Brew, but I think you alluded to, to it already, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. So he, he's asking, what is the effect of correlations between predictions on the performance of your method? Is it like more robust than lasso and so on? Yeah. So, okay. So, I mean, I think I'll, I'll give, um, I'll give a partial answer and then I'll note why it's partial. I mean, so what we're, what we are seeing in practice is that in the presence of correlated predictors, that we do see this much better performance than the lasso and these various forms of the lasso. That being said, what we don't have in this paper and we don't have in the next paper, I think is like a deep understanding of that or a deep discussion of that. And so something that would be cool is to get a better, you know, maybe a more like theoretical understanding instead of just an empirical one, but empirically it does seem like we see this, uh, this result. Gotcha. Okay. So the uh, next question from Alexandra Dragici, I hope I didn't murder that, that name. He was asking, how are you classifying whether the effects are real or, or not real? Um, yeah, great, great. This is a great clarifying question. So let's, let, yeah, let's step back a second. So the real problem, I think, just in, in parameter estimation in general, and here we're doing selection and estimation, is that you don't have ground truth. And so there's something that's, you know, very satisfying and nice about prediction. And I think this is why you see it so often in machine learning is because you can do it. But 
I think it's also important to not conflate what we can do with what we would like to do because sometimes they're just fundamentally different things. And so what we're trying to do in this paper is somehow get closer to what we actually want to do. Like what is our actual goal and measure it? Now we have to do that in the, in the face of not knowing what the ground truth is. And so somehow we have to come up with a way to actually know going in what are real associations between covariates and responses and what are fake ones. And so one easy way to do that is to simulate. And what I mean by simulate, very specifically, is we take that linear model I showed you in the beginning. We take a bunch of covariates, either simulated or real. We saw both examples in, in the slides. And then for some of the theta, we just set the thetas to be zero. And for some of them, we set the thetas to be substantial and non-zero. So technically what we're picking up is that they're negligible or non-negligible. So what we essentially have to do is to simulate negligible and non-negligible thetas. Now, once we have simulated a data set with known negligible or non-negligible thetas, we know the answer. We know which correct, which, which effects are truly non-negligible and which ones are truly negligible, which ones are truly not very small, and which ones are, are, are very small or zero in this case. And so what we can do is we can ask, did we pick that up correctly? We can say, okay, here's what the algorithm estimated the theta is to be. Technically speaking, in this case, we get a full posterior. So we could ask, is that posterior sufficiently far from zero? Is the mass sufficiently far from zero? Um, but we can ask like, what, what were these estimated to be? And then we can compare to that ground truth. So in that sense, we have created a ground truth by simulating. Now, as we said, the challenge with that is that relies on the simulation being one that we all accept as being representative of real life. And so one aspect of that is simulating the X's. Those might not be really truly as correlated as real life X's. That one's relatively easy to get around because we can just take real life correlated X's and simulate the thetas on top of them. That's not too hard. What's harder is really getting a sense of the true relationship between a response and a set of covariates. And so that's what we tried to do in this last experiment is we said, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a very small dimensional data set that effectively represents, there are true relationships between those X's, X1 to X6 in this case, and Y, and, and the X1 times X2 and X2 times X3 and Y. And here we're saying, we just don't know the thetas in that data set. So we can't tell you whether they're correct or incorrect. We know there are some relationships between those X1s, X2, X3, and Y, but we don't know what they are. So we can't talk about those being correct or incorrect. But what we can do is append a ton of totally fake covariates that definitely are incorrect because they have nothing to do with this data set. I think it's the, the comment earlier was fantastic. Something we could have done is append totally fake covariates that themselves are totally real covariates. In this case, it happened that they were simulated, but these are all good experiments to run. And we just know that all of these are fake because they had nothing to do with the original data set. And so that's why I made this sort of distinction in this final slide, which I'll maybe just go back to briefly. Here, where I, I colored things blue instead of green and said no order to them because we don't know the effects there. We don't know the effects because they're from a real data set where we just don't know the ground truth. All we know is that when we added all these totally fake covariates that had nothing to do with this data set, that there can be no relationship between the response and those because there, there's just patently no way for there to be a relationship. And so that's how we know which are the fake effects here. Again, because we've made it so that they had no relationship to the response. But we don't actually know the original facts in this case. It's only in the other cases that we, we know the ground truth. Hopefully that answers the question. Cool. Thank you. So another, another question from David Kahn's, um how well does SCIM do in comparison to Bayesian decision theoretic methods, such as the projective predictive inference of Pironin or Hahn and uh, Carvalho? I think you, you mentioned earlier that it's sort of building on, on some of this work, but maybe you can clarify it. So it is, it is possible that I'm not sure exactly what the question is referring to, but let me mention the things that I cited and I can compare to that. So if you look at the, um, the original work on the horseshoe or the regularized horseshoe, that's specifically for picking out in a model without interactions. So picking out a sparse set of covariates in a model without interactions. So that's not interactions based. And so that wouldn't be something that we would at least be able to do this interactions testing with. If you look at the Chipman, the work, the Griffith and Brown work, um, so those are the two interactions based methods. So in those cases, I, I believe that the highest that they ran up to in the original papers was something around like 13 covariates. And those were effectively represented by when I showed earlier the comparison to like method number one and method number two that you could use with Markov Chimney Carlo. That's sort of, you know, what, what these methods are suggesting we might do. And we can see that we, we sort of can't run those methods on the sizes of data sets that we're looking at here. Like we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to run that in 
a reasonable amount of time. And so the, I guess the comparison that we're making there is I fully expect that if you could run those methods, that they would perform very well in terms of accuracy, but we can't run them in terms of time. And so this is, again, sort of emphasizing, I think, like the, the big thing that we're doing in this particular paper, um, although we get beyond this in the other paper, is that we're, we're, we're really focusing on the speed up. So I think that we're building, again, on the shoulders of giants with modeling that like the, it's, it's really this horseshoe that I think is enabling us to do so much better than the lasso. And I can get into this more, but I think it's effectively, you know, all these things are meant to be approximating an L0 norm. And you're getting closer to that with a horseshoe than a, than a lasso. But what we're providing here is the speed up so that you can actually run it that you can actually get those benefits. And then I'll just mention that one thing that is very substantively different from those particular methods is this new paper, which you have no knowledge of because I didn't really talk about it and I'm just saying it's coming, but I, I do want to plug you to, to read it when it does go off, where we're getting into this non-linearity um, and we're getting into um, interaction discovery in the presence of non-linearity and getting away from things like strong hierarchy. And so, so that would be quite, quite different than the models that we have typically seen in this space before. Right. Well, I, I can tell you from, from my point of view, I, I'm really looking forward to these methods working. And I, I'd much rather use this than pay huge fees to Amazon Web Services to run these models. Some, some of our models you know, take a few days uh, to run. And uh, I think it would be great uh, to, to get these speed ups and, and, and interactions you know, in, in drug development and uh, other fields as well. Interactions are everywhere. Uh, cool. And so this is a super important problem. Really happy that you're working on it and, and would love to see more there. So with, with that, let's let's wrap this up. Thanks again. I really appreciate you coming on the program, Tamara. We wish you best of luck in your in your research. We will see you guys next month. We'll have another great speaker It'll be sometime in the middle of June. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me out. And thanks to everybody who listened.